I've studied women's rights in Afghanistan for 20 years. I've researched NGOs and civil society organizations, and I've conducted that research on the ground, learning from the men and women who live there. I've written academic books, articles, and taught on the subject. And as the last US troops left Afghanistan on August 31st, 2021, I've spent many sleepless nights pouring over a spreadsheet of 154 names, 30 people I've worked with and their immediate family members. Most are in hiding for fear the Taliban will injure, imprison, or murder them. I get phone calls regularly, including this morning. What's the latest? What's happening? When can we get out? Some feared a Taliban resurgence, and so they got passports. Others were shocked it happened, that it happened so quickly, or that the capital city, Kabul, fell in a matter of days. And now, I can't stop thinking about a common Afghan joke my friend Seema told me many years ago. The Americans have watches, but the Taliban have time. The US came to Afghanistan with an outsized and outmatched level of technology, weapons, education, knowledge, and dollars. The Taliban, a draconian regime, began in the 1990s by radicalizing boys and young men from Afghan refugee camps in Pakistan. Many people mistakenly believed that the Taliban disappeared during the American occupation, but they were there all along, watching and waiting. The Americans have watches, but the Taliban have time. So this talk will be a post-mortem of sorts, looking back at the last 20 years at one of the many ways we failed by falling short and not listening to the women and men of Afghanistan. Because we cared more about our rhetoric, our politics, and our propaganda than we cared about them. After the US-led invasion of Afghanistan on October 7, 2001, the Bush administration faced a public backlash and so they directed our attention to a new goal. We Americans can save Afghan women from the brutality of the Taliban. Billions of dollars of military, humanitarian aid, and economic development assistance flooded into the country. But those dollars came with a certain agenda. You may recall George W. Bush's mission accomplished photo op after the invasion of Iraq. The media joked about it. But that photo op is indicative of a larger problem. Far too many international efforts to help the women of Afghanistan were in today's parlance all for the gram. For example, early efforts to reconstruct Afghanistan, newspapers published photos of shiny new buildings with children standing in front, because that kind of thing looks like progress to us. But for many Afghans, daily life remained under threat. New school buildings were easy targets for insurgent violence and bombings. So many parents tried, basically kept their children safe at home. I met many women whose own work was photographed and put online as if to say, look what we've done for the women of Afghanistan which would have been great, except for many of those international organizations may have funded projects, but the difficult work of implementing them happened by Afghan women themselves, why the international organizations took all the credit. Fahima, for example, started a carpentry business in her hometown. And when I first met her, I said, wow, you look so familiar. She didn't know why. And then I remembered I'd seen photos of her online. I pulled the website up on my laptop and I showed it to her. She became so upset because she had not given them permission to take, let alone use her picture on their website. 
In fact, she didn't even recognize the name of the organization. Far too many international organizations were more interested in looking like they were helping than actually helping the women in Afghanistan. In other cases, international organizations believed because they had the money to spend, they knew best how to help. The media also perpetuated the U.S. government's obsession with unveiling Afghan women as a path to their liberation. Many Americans can't imagine wearing a veil, let alone a burqa, so removing it must be a solution. We were eager to see their faces. But when I spoke to different women across Afghanistan, I learned that this piece of clothing is a problem for few, a minor inconvenience for some, and simply part of their daily wardrobe choices for many. Many women told me they were happy to wear the veil because it meant they could go places. Removing the burqa or chadri was what we focused on, which quite literally veiled the actual acute and diverse needs of Afghan women. We were so fixated on the idea that Islam is a religion of oppression that we failed to recognize that it could actually be used as a tool for women's rights. In Afghanistan, the social structure of the country centers around the family and Islam as a guiding belief system. So many of the gains for women's rights over the last 20 years occurred because women's rights activists worked with men and within Islam, using the Quran as a guide to improve women's lives. For example, there are some customary practices in Afghanistan that use marriage to bridge divides between families in conflict, where a man from one family has significantly injured or even murdered a man from another family, and there's a clear perpetrator and victim, a woman, a young woman, from the perpetrator's family will be given to the victim's family. The idea being that you will resolve the conflict and avoid future conflicts by joining the two families together through a marriage. May sound good on paper, but in reality, many of these women who experience these exchanges live a torturous existence. They're mistreated or abused for, as punishment for their relative's crime. Now, here's the interesting thing. This practice is completely haram, forbidden in Islam. So women's rights activists have worked with male religious leaders, imams and mullahs, to eradicate these practices in their local communities. Not because it goes against Western feminism or international human rights, but because it's forbidden in Islam. Advocating for Afghan women within an Islamic framework has and could continue to work in Afghanistan. However, the Taliban's radical and extremist interpretations of Islam leave little room for women's rights. They manipulate Islam. They do not represent Islam. They don't listen to women. But have we? When you take the time to listen, to understand what people are struggling with and what they need, when you truly understand their culture, and you see them as fellow humans, then you can begin to work together to improve people's lives. But instead, according to the US government's own reports, we spent many billions of dollars in Afghanistan without providing a sustainable program to improve women's lives. Rather than listening, we try to impose our values posting self-congratulatory photos online, when many of the real successes happen on a small scale, in communities, at a local level, by, with, and for the women of Afghanistan. But like I said, many women's rights activists have left or are desperately trying to leave the country. Neela, for example, was the director for several schools run by a small Afghan organization. She's a feminist and a women's rights activist, 
but many Americans wouldn't recognize her as such because she dresses so conservatively. She ran schools to help young girls catch up to their male peers and then join the larger school system in Kabul. She hired female teachers, and she organized women's job readiness trainings. But now, she's in hiding. Her teachers are unemployed, and the mission of her organization is effectively dead under the Taliban's new regime. Already, the Taliban has banned girls and women from attending high schools and colleges. Now, many schools are fighting back, but most women and girls fear that education will move underground again as it did in the 1990s, happening in secret throughout the country. As we speak, every woman in government is gone. In most likelihood, many women will continue to work at home as part of an informal economy. But what will happen to their hopes and dreams? And this just goes to show you how complicated the situation is. In the absence of, absence of the Taliban, many women flourished, but not always as a direct result of U.S.-funded programs, while economic assistance is still desperately needed. It was because the U.S. was a bigger bully than the Taliban. In the absence of Taliban control, many women found space to advocate for themselves. Luckily, Afghan women won't give up fighting. Their strength and resilience will endure. But I've received so many tearful phone calls over the last two months. How could your country do this to us? You abandon us. And it's true, we did abandon them. And now we must do everything we can to help those get out. To work with our allies in neighboring countries to keep those who cannot leave safe from harm. But it's really not good enough, is it? Because we've made these mistakes before. Afghanistan is just the tip of the iceberg of U.S. involvement in the world. If we look at the countries the U.S. has invaded and aided, they remain largely unstable. In Afghanistan, the regime we ousted is now back in power. The war in Iraq led to the creation of ISIS, and the Iraqi government continues to use torture, arbitrary arrest, and excessive force against its own people. These U.S. military and development engagements throughout the world may make us feel safer, but they have not created economic or political stability in those places. If we really want to help people around the world, if we really want to help women, we must rethink, reconceptualize, and reconsider how and why we intervene in other countries. Institutional knowledge and a deep historical understanding of a people and their place does not look good in a campaign ad and is difficult to harness into a soundbite. But it's the only thing that works. We have the skills and ability to listen and understand, and we choose not to at our peril. Afghanistan is a lesson for us all. If we rethink, we can do better. Thank you. Thank you.